Hi, I'm Laura King, and I am the network chair for the Jewish Federations of North America, and I'm here today with Dr. Robert Adler. Uh, we're going to speak today about his experiences of his father who escaped from Vienna, uh, was helped by the Pope Pius VII, and uh, arrived the in the, the 12th, excuse me. Uh, and arrived in the Dominican Republic, eventually uh, saving his life. And Dr. Adler, can you state your name and introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Dr. Robert Leon Adler. Uh, I'm a professor of foreign languages here at the University of North Alabama. I grew up in, in New York City, um, where I went to elementary, high school, and college, and I did my graduate work at Washington University in St. Louis before coming here to uh, Alabama. And today you serve on the Holocaust Commission here in Alabama. Yes, I'm on the Alabama Holocaust Commission, uh, also in the Education Committee. I was uh, appointed by Governor Riley uh, a few years ago. Very mm -hmm. nice. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you, if you would just uh, begin your story about your father uh, returned to Vienna and uh, his eventual journey that began in uh, 1940. Mm -hmm. to reach the Dominican Republic? Well, <clears throat> it's a very interesting story that he began to tell me in little pieces when I was a child and <clears throat> some I, I remembered, some I didn't remember and then he would remind me but generally not talk very much about it. But it started to a large degree uh, when, when he was pretty young. Um, <laughs> My father was the, the middle child of three. He had a younger sister and an older sister uh, living in, in Vienna, right downtown. And he was one of the, one of the bully boys in, <laughs> in the street. Uh, also a mountain climber. He, he, did, he did a lot of things. Uh, his, his father, his, his biological father passed away when he was very young. I really don't know when or under what circumstances. But his mother remarried, so he was living with uh, his mother and his um, um, stepfather. And when he was a teenager, uh, for various reasons, my, my dad wanted to be a, um, a dentist. His father wanted him to work in the, in the grocery store. They didn't see eye to eye. So my, my father ran away from home and joined the French Foreign Legion for six years, <laughs> where he fought in, uh, in North Africa. And he was, he was a guard on Devil's Island and things like, things like this. So after six years, he, he had disappeared from Vienna. <clears throat> All of a sudden, there was a knock on his mother's door. She opens the door, and there he was after six years. She hadn't seen him. Um, and he, he moved back to Vienna. Uh, he started a business. Uh, he got married and s started a, uh, a life there. And then came the Anschluss in, I believe it was March of, uh, of 1938. Mm -hmm. And things started to happen for the, um, for the Jews in Germany and, and in Austria. Uh, his stepfather said, don't worry, they're not going to bother us because I fought for uh, Austria in World War I. Well, he was wrong. <laughs> because things did happen. They were, they were deporting Jews from all over the, um, um, <clears throat> the country. And so my father, uh, having, having been a, uh, a mountain climber uh, and knowing the passes into Switzerland, was helping people uh, escape into, into neutral Switzerland. When he was caught by the Nazis out in the, um, out in the countryside, he was taken to a, um, a feeder camp and he was being transported uh, from a feeder camp to another camp when he escaped from the train, from one of those transport trains, uh, with a German priest. Uh, since he was with a German priest, they decided to seek asylum in Italy in the, um, in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And he was able to get in there. Uh, the, he spent as far as, as far as I know, between five weeks and t or two months or six weeks in, um, in the Vatican, he met Pope Pius. He told, me, he told me this several times, that he met Pope Pius XII. And for, it was there that he was able to find out that um, Rafael Leonidas Trujillo, mm -hmm. the uh, head of state of the D Dominican Republic, uh, had declared in 1938 that he wanted European refugees to come to the Dominican Republic. There was a uh, community in 
the central north of the country of, uh, of Sosua, that was primarily uh, European Jews, but they had been there for, for quite a long time and it, it was dispersing, mm -hmm. so he wanted to re-fortify re the, um, the Jewish community in the, in the Dominican Republic, and so he wanted up to 100,000 European refugees. It turns mm -hmm. out he only got about 800. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my, my dad was one of them. He was a very lucky one. Very fortunate. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions regarding the time your father was actually uh -huh. at the Vatican. Um, we understand that your father was protected there in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. um, did he ever indicate how many Jews were also sheltered in the Vatican at that time? No, he never spoke about the situation there. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he had told me that he was there, that he met uh, Pope Pius, mm -hmm. but that was really as, as, as far as, he went, as it went. He didn't tell me where exactly he lived or how many other people or what the situation was there in, um, in the Vatican. But like I said, this is where he found out that Trujillo wanted um, mm -hmm. uh, European refugees to come and they facilitated the visas that, that were necessary. Mm -hmm. So he was able to get a transit visa through, through France to go into Spain Mm -hmm. because um, the head of state in, uh, in Spain, um, in General Francisco Franco, uh, one of the reasons he and Hitler did not get along is that Franco refused to deport his Jews. To him, the Jews and the Muslims uh, were the Arabs, were very important to the history of Spain and to the mm -hmm. culture of Spain, and he wanted to acknowledge that and preserve that. And he actually issued an edict saying that any Jew with a, a shred of Spanish uh, heritage could come to Spain and be safe. And other Jews could, could pass through Spain mm -hmm. on their way to, uh, to other countries. And uh, my father was connected through the connections uh, at the Vatican with the consulate of Spain mm -hmm. and was able to get a visa to be able to go through there. So he went from Italy through um, uh, southern France into Spain through Portugal. He had a visa for that too. And before you go any further, I know that you brought documents here today yes, that I did. show that. And I was wondering if you would show that to the camera. And the, yes, uh, of course. Your father's passport from <coughs> the Nazi occupied Austria. This one was very interesting. <laughs> the Deutsches Reich. Uh huh. And when we look inside, it has the Reason Pass. The rice pass. Rice pass, mm -hmm. and it has the red J mm -hmm. for <laughs> for <a> Jew. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly, and his picture inside with the stamp with the swastika. <laughs> so <laughs> this is an, an, an authentic um, um, passport for him, and it describes wh where he was, where he had to go. Um, we've got stamps from um, Italy in, in the Consulate of France in Italy, the uh, Consulate of the Dominican Republic uh, in Italy for him to have the visas to be able to go through. This was, the, this was in uh, September of 1939. Then in case he had to pass through Panama, he could, pa he could pass through Panama. He had a visa to go there, uh, here, through, through Portugal. So he was already in Italy in 1939. He, mm -hmm. he had already gone. Right. Okay. So it, w it was very, so very soon after. So this, to a large degree, here we have the consulate uh, in Italy from, uh, of Spain getting the uh, necessary documentation to be able to make those travels. Mm -hmm. Here's the um, letter, letter of, of, of transit through France. <coughs> so he could pass through France and go to uh, Spain. So he had to get, pass through and, and get out of the country. Also his um, entry into New York, and it says one day in transit to the Dominican Republic. And on the next page is from the um, Dominican uh, consulate in New York, allowing him to uh, travel to the Dominican Republic. And here is his entry in, uh, on July 13th, 1941, into Puerto Plata. The Dominican Republic is a, uh, a city in the north part of the, uh, of the island. Okay. So this, to a large degree, shows his, um, his travels. 
So from 1939 until 1941. Uh-huh. It took him to, to get, get out there. of Europe into the Dominican Republic. Exactly. <laughs> and also, um, this uh, Austrian passport that was issued in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. Even though it says uh, Austria up here, it's, it was issued in uh, Ciudad Trujillo, this allowing him to be there and... Um, I'm curious, does that passport also identify him by religion? Uh, this one does not. Mm -hmm. It uh, eye color, domicile, and hair color, and these kinds of things, but no, it doesn't. <laughs> and here, his admission into, uh, into, Spain, into the United States in uh, September of 1948, mm -hmm. um, because, because, as I said, in, in Spain, in, uh, I'm sorry, in the Dominican Republic, he met my mother, and it was interesting because my grandfather, my mother's father, was postmaster general uh, of the Dominican Republic. So it was very curious when they met because my, my mother didn't speak German, my father didn't <laughs> speak French, didn't speak uh, Spanish, Spanish, so <laughs> they spoke French <laughs> when they first met. Oh, that's a nice story. <laughs> uh <-huh. It's, laughs> exactly. Um, and he, he had a business, he had a trucking business. He was trucking lumber um, <clears throat> from uh, different places around the country. Mm -hmm. So since my, my grandfather was postmaster general, my dad had government connections, so he was able to get tires, he was able to get gasoline. He had a wonderful life there. He didn't, and when, when she got pregnant with me, she wanted to come to the United States because this is after the war. Mm -hmm. The United States is the greatest country in the world. I want my son to be born there. I want my child to be born there. He said, no, 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 I'm not going. <laughs> because he had... So he a, fell in love with the Dominican absolutely, Republic. Absolutely. He had a maid there, mm -hmm. but she was who she was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And she, she came to New York. She stayed first with uh, his younger sister, who was already in New York with her family. And he came right before I was born, because I was born in December, and here he's leaving in September. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so he, he kind of waited to the last minute. He waited to the last <laughs> minute, <laughs> exactly, and, and stayed in New York, mm -hmm. uh, and actually never left the country. Yes, we did travel into Canada and places like this, but he never left the country. So when you went to the Dominican Republic, it was with your mother? Uh, it, it was by myself by first. Yourself. Mm -hmm. my, f my parents started sending me to the Dominican Republic to spend the summers when I was seven years old because they wanted me to be aware of that part of my family mm -hmm. also. So in, in New York, I was raised in, in, in a Jewish community, uh, in a Jewish atmosphere. I started going to Hebrew school at six years old, the, these kinds of things. But... <coughs> The language uh, in, in my home pretty much was Spanish, especially, mm -hmm. especially when I was very young. Um, and they wanted me to be aware of uh, that part of, of my family. Also, they wanted to get, to get me off the streets of New York for the summer yeah. <laughs> when I wasn't in school. <laughs> <laughs> that was important, too, so they, they sent Your me Your father down. having known about those things. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So at seven years old, I remember they took me to the airport and I had, I had a sign with <coughs> name and address uh, of, on both countries <laughs> printed <laughs> on the, they handed me to the stewardess. <laughs> um, and, and, and I did, did the seven hour trip to, uh, to the Dominican Republic. And I remember it precisely because um, on the way down, I fell asleep and I missed breakfast. So even though Pan American doesn't exist anymore, the airline industry still owes me a meal. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't miss a meal on airplanes because they owe me one. But anyway, <laughs> and it was very important for me, and I'm very glad that they did this for me mm -hmm. um, to, sh to show me um, <clears throat> That, that part of my family. Mm -hmm. So I, li I lived with, um, with my grandfather, um, my aunt, who, who was the youngest of the uh, sisters. They were, I think, f f three sisters and one brother, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and my cousin. And it was very good to, um, to have that mm -hmm, and to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't mind, I just want to um, 
go over a couple of questions with Certainly. you too before we leave uh, that particular area. There was a letter um, that's in the archive now uh, that written by a woman named Luciano Zevi, and she reports that her family uh, had an audience with Pope Pius XII in 1947. And she claims that her uncle identified the Pope who was dressed in Franciscan robes and was physically actually in the Jewish ghetto and brought him into the Vatican. Mm -hmm. She then stated that Cardinal Montini, which uh, Paul VI, uh, standing next to Pius XII, immediately silenced her uncle and told him never, never to repeat this story. Have you heard in, of any similar stories like this? No, no. Well, from my father, no. Mm -hmm. um, but l later on, this began to interest me, and I started to investigate what happened with, with Pope Pius, with, with Franco, certainly, since I, I study and teach Spanish and, and have lived in Spain. Um, and so I, I begin to see stories that are very similar. My, my dad never talked about who was there, what other Jews were there, what Pope Pius did. Uh, um, with with other people, mm -hmm. he did tell me that he did meet him personally because he was there for uh, for several weeks. He did meet him personally several times. Did they speak? Uh, yes. And, and do you remember anything about the conversation? Not really, not really. Th these are these are not things that he t that he told me specifically mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in in later life when I knew more about this because my father uh, didn't pass away until the year two thousand. He was ninety four, and he was. <coughs> pretty coherent mm -hmm. uh, until then, uh, but he absolutely refused to talk about these stories. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to bring back those, those memories. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would ask him <laughs> ag mm. again and again when I went to, because this, this was important, mm -hmm. and at that age, I knew that he was going to be not, not going to be around very much longer, and I really wanted to know and really wanted to preserve these kinds of stories, and he absolutely refused. To, um, to tell me this, and it, it's very common mm -hmm. for um, survivors to not talk about this because they were, they were horrific memories. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those kinds of things I don't know specifically from my father. Mm -hmm. Now through research that I've done and things that I've read, um, <coughs> yes, I've heard similar stories, but from mm -hmm. him personally, no. Okay. Do you remember, or did your father ever say the name of the individual, the priest that brought him to the Vatican? No. I uh, only mm -hmm. know that it was, it was a German priest. He was a German priest, right. okay. And did he ever encounter him after he went to the Vatican? Mm -mm. So once he arrived, he was... Once he arrived, I guess they were there together, but mm -hmm. when, once my father left, um, there, there was nothing else, um, um, no, no, no more communication. No further contact? Or right. Something? And it's curious because when, when I, I, was, I was in the service for three years, I was in the army for three years, and I was stationed uh, about two years in Heidelberg, Germany, mm -hmm. and naturally I, I asked my father if he would come take me visit, and I said, and no way. Right. <laughs> Absolutely not. Not surprising. Yeah. yeah. And all, but in the year before, in a few years before, because I studied in Spain in uh, the 69-70 academic year. I was there for 11 months. And my father told me, do not come home unless you've been to Vienna. <laughs> so we so still, he had, still had love for we, Vienna. Exactly. Yeah. We still had and relatives in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to, to see them. Unfortunately, and you met them? Or? I, I only left three or, three or four days to go to Vienna. I was sorry I should have left more time to see that because it was a fascinating mm -hmm. uh, place. And I did meet them. And um, they took me to my father's original home, and they explained he was there, and he did this and this, nice, <laughs> and all kinds of things. Nice. Uh, Probably stories you didn't get from your father. Exactly. <laughs> I've had stories about him being the bully boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, so that's the, how you know he was the bully boy. Uh -huh, ah, yeah, I heard stories him about him, yeah. <laughs> well, the French Foreign Legion sort of gave that away. Absolutely. Too. Absolutely, but um, he, he personally, there was no way that he was going to go back to, um, to mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. And which is pretty, again, pretty normal uh, sure. reaction to that. Although I know recently a lot of people toward the end of their lives have begun to do that. Mm -hmm. But I know it's a very difficult thing to do. 
we understand also that there exists a photograph of Jewish protectees that were hidden and were helping with the evacuation under St. Peter's Basilica. Mm -hmm. And did your father ever mention uh, where the Jews were hiding or working at this evacuation project no. at as, all? As I said, he never explained to me what he did there mm -hmm. um, besides being there for five, six weeks. He, he never told me what, what, what circumstances, where he lived, what he did during that time. Mm -hmm. not, not that I remember uh, him telling me any specifics about what happened there. We just know that he was at the Vatican. Yes, that he and, was and there and that he met Paul Pines, there. yeah, mm -hmm. and sheltered there. Mm -hmm. Whatever sheltered means um, mm -hmm. at that time. Um, we're aware also that the Vatican was the entity that worked hard to get the transit documents mm -hmm. like you were showing earlier, the visas and the arranged transportation for Jews leaving Europe. Uh, one of the eyewitness testimonies was from Monsignor Giovanni Ferrofino. Uh, he was 98 and he was a priest who physically worked directly under the Pope and was sent to Portugal to meet with the president to request mm -hmm. entry visas into Portugal. And you've just showed me uh, yeah. one. Visas in, into Spain, into Portugal, into Panama, into the Dominican Republic, uh, through transit visas through France, all these things. And I'm sure that they were facilitated by the, these mechanisms okay. organized by the Vatican. Later, he was posted as a secretary to the Nuncio uh, Archbishop uh, Maurizio Silvani to the Dominican Republic. Curiously uh, enough. <laughs> yes, I, I didn't. Know, I, I know that you read my notes earlier, mm -hmm. so you know this. Uh, Monsignor Sintioni would travel with the Nuncio at least two times per year from 1939 to 1945, which corresponds with what you've showed us, uh, to request visas for fleeing Jews. Mm -hmm. Uh, he and Nuncio would drive uh, one and a half days directly to meet with General uh, Tuido with a double encrypted telegram directly from Pope Pius XII that would request a specific number of visas for Jews mm -hmm. leaving both mm -hmm. Spain and Portugal. And he estimates that well over 12,000 visas were obtained by his personal efforts. Now, the figure that actually came to the Dominican Republic that well, you was, researched? was about 800. Was only 800. But as you, as you saw in the documentation, they, he stopped in several places. So in order to get there, inclu mm -hmm. including New York City, even though it was a one-day uh, so um, transit. So we, we can count these as multiple it's, visas for, yeah, for an for individual. One way, or yeah. it, it could be that people having doing that trip decided to stay in one place and not actually get to uh, the Dominican Republic. Yeah, and, and I think that that's probably true because mm. it goes on, uh, the documents that we have show that Monsignor Ferrofino also helped Jews in the Dominican Republic to travel to the US, U.S. through Canada, Cuba, and Mexico, mm -hmm. and some of those remained, and um, so they didn't continue on to Dominican Republic. Yeah. Some didn't continue and some got there and then went somewhere else. Uh -huh. uh, was your father aware that it was the Vatican that obtained the travel documents oh, for yeah. him? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and and it, it it is really evident in that passport because all of these are uh, in Italy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so Italy was the country he left uh, Europe from. Um, right. Well, well the, the from the Vatican prior to right. arriving from Vienna. Mm-hmm. And no, after arriving from Vienna. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. After arriving from Vienna, he yeah. he went. He was taken to the Vatican, so he escaped somewhere between Vienna and. And he, I would assume that it's somewhere between a feeder camp uh, in Austria and a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. He may have been in Germany or or someplace else, and that's mm -hmm. where he escaped with the uh, with the German priest, mm -hmm. and they made their way down. Um, um, to the Alps. To, to Rome, yeah. Mm -hmm to the Vatican okay. because, as I said, my dad had been a mountain climber, so he knew all the passes, he knew all the, the routes <laughs> and all these, all these things. When, when your father came to the Dominican Republic, did he ever mention that he had any contact with any of the Catholic clergy there after he arrived? Um, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. That okay. I don't know. Uh, I would assume because my um, 
my mother's family is Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, my my um, grandfather was a 33rd degree Mason, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so he had that kind of thing too. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember going to going to mass with them and these kinds of things. So. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, and, and, and being a high government official, I'm sure he had interactions with um, church officials mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic. Now, my father personally, maybe, maybe not, mm -hmm. he, had, he had a trucking business um, mm -hmm. going at this time. And, and like I said, when after he, he escaped by, him, by himself uh, with, with the German priest, leaving his wife and, and his um, mother and his stepfather who were uh, deported and um, taken to concentration camps, certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another eyewitness testimony that we have is from uh, Monsignor Giancarlo Cintioni. Uh, Monsignor Cintioni personally obtained cash and Vatican uh, passports directly from the papal household, and it was specifically to help Jews escape to Switzerland. Did your father receive any cash or a Vatican passport for his journey? Um, and you're aware of where this money or passport, and was he aware of where the money or passport would have come from? You stated earlier that he, he understood that the Vatican arranged the passport. Mm -hmm. Was he given cash or anything to travel to Switzerland? Or it was, it, judging from the passport I saw, it mm -hmm. looked like he went Italy toward Milan and then cut through France and, and did through, not go through, through Switzerland. Going in through France and into Spain. Okay, so into Spain. Switzerland was not part of his journey. Mm -hmm. so. No, okay. he, w he was captured helping people uh, escape into uh, Switzerland because Switzerland yeah, was remember, neutral. Yeah, was neutral in the at beginning. Mm -hmm. um, well, when, when I look at those visas, they're paid for, and some of them are paid for in dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So <laughs> That's interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. Which brings me to the next question, exactly. which so leads right into be, one of them. It would be the Vatican mm -hmm. who would have access to dollars in order to pay those kinds of, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and, and this leads me to another question that may have something to do with those dollars. Uh, relatives of a lot of the survivors who did travel to Dominican Republic told us that it was a Jewish relief agency which arranged their transport. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of a Jewish agency that did handle these issues, and can you explain how they would obtain travel documents? Um, <coughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not aware of it through my father. Okay, so he uh, never mentioned any. No, Jewish No, he never agency. mentioned how he mm -hmm. how he got there. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the um, um, visas have to do with airfare, mm -hmm. so he, he flew to mm -hmm. to a lot of, to a lot of these places. And who arranged that? Who paid for it? And things like this. That I don't know. We don't through know. him. No. Okay. I mean, we know that there were Jewish agencies operating right. in the area, like the Joint Distribution Committee. Right. And so, so, so it's, it's likely that one of them uh, helped him, but I don't know for sure. Have you ever contacted the uh, Joint Distribution Committee and to see if there's anything on your father in the archives there? No, I haven't yet. <laughs> would you like me to check on that Absolutely. for you? Absolutely. I, I would like to know more of the story because here well Pope Pius was um, crucial in mm -hmm. all of this and um, his personal activity and what he set up within the um, the Catholic Church definitely helped um, so many Jews my father is, is um, as Your an father example. wouldn't be alive without exactly. uh, his intervention. But there, there were uh, so many others through he you also yeah. the and same kind I'm of just thing. kind of curious if, if Pope Pius the twelfth also worked with some of the agencies as well very uh, likely quietly he's, on he's the side to, yeah he certainly to, met with uh, with Franco with, mm -hmm. with general Franco and had influence with uh, with Trujillo also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so he was as, as the Pope uh, in contact with these kinds of um, High, high officials in Catholic countries like this. Yeah, so there was no question that without his influence, there would have been no uh, escape to the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no, there's no question for mm -hmm. me about that. Mm -hmm. It, it had to be through him and the organization that he set up. Mm -hmm. Would you like to show some of the photographs of your father? <laughs> Certainly. I think this one is an, is an important one <coughs> inside this uh, passport. 
um, of him because here he's got a stamp with with the swastika and there it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. My parents' wedding picture. <laughs> nice. I do have a larger version at home that's framed. Wow. <laughs> this one. So you had that made, I guess, from this photo? Um, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think so, that it was, it was made from this. When you visited your relatives, did they share photos with you too? Yes, they did. Wonderful. Yes, they did. They, they showed me. And of his parents. He did manage to get some pictures out. It may have been also from his, uh, his younger sister who was in New York. This, this is his mother mm -hmm. and his, his mother and his stepfather. These are two pictures of his, of his mother and his stepfather. So he was able to, to obtain these, these pictures. And I had them in, in my home. I haven't seen these in years and years and years. I, I forgot that I even had them. It was fortuitous <laughs> that you I found them. And I found them this yeah. morning <laughs> as I was looking for things to, uh, to bring here. So very, cur very curious. When your father was in the Dominican Republic, did he have any contact with others? Uh, that had escaped to the Dominican well, Republic? Well, that's very likely because he was in, um, in Sosua, in this, in this town, mm -hmm. for, for a short time mm -hmm. in the north. But then when he, he met my mother, uh, his, his life changed pretty much. And also, as I said, he had, he had a trucking business, mm -hmm. and he was, he was very involved with that. So chances are that he had less contact with um, Jews in that community. Mm -hmm. But they, they, there was there was a um, a pretty strong community there, and um, I'm sure and, that he had contact today, with them. Uh, what is it like there today? Do you um, know? It's it's a it's a small town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's still a small town at the end of a dirt road. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how many of the people that came are actually still resident in the Dominican Republic today. I'm curious about that too. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, but there's no people that you could speak that uh, you're aware of that you're in contact with well, from not the that Dominican I'm in contact Republic with. that had uh, similar circumstances as your father. There are some, and um, a couple of years ago, at one of the colleges in in New York, they they did an exhibit, but I wasn't able to contact them at the time. But I, I still do have the um, contact information mm -hmm. of the people who set that up, and I'd like to contact them to see if and what kinds of things they have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I may be able to help you with some of okay. that. <laughs> I'll just get some information from you, and, and there are people that can do yeah. a lot of that tracking down, and because they keep archives of uh, the Jewish people and, and where exactly, everyone went. Exactly, because they so. were so few. As I said, there were only about 800 mm -hmm. who came during this period, mm -hmm. so chances are that there are records um, there of um, their activity. Mm -hmm. And um, when your father came to the United States, uh, how did he spend the rest of his life? What well, did he do? <laughs> um, he, he was already in his mid-40s, mm -hmm. so uh, he, he actually went, in, he went into um, the garment business with his brother-in-law. He became a garment finisher. Mm -hmm. He only worked for his brother-in-law a very short time because he didn't want to work for his brother-in-law. <laughs> they worked for, <laughs> for, for a couple of other companies. Um, until he until he retired, mm -hmm. and then when he retired from the garment business, he went to work for um, Kennedy Airport as mm -hmm. a security sergeant, because he spoke German, he spoke Spanish, he spoke Portuguese, he spoke Italian, he spoke French. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so being able to speak so many languages, um, he, he was uh, optimal mm -hmm. for this kind of activity, and he worked in that at, at least ten years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that I remember, if not longer, at Kennedy Airport in New and York. Probably the French Foreign Legion background didn't uh, hurt either. <laughs> it didn't hurt, exactly. So he, 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 was, he was pretty much of a go-getter. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he, he, he smoked for 60 years. Mm. His, his, his uh, doctor, who was my cousin's, um, uh, Rita's husband, said that if he, if he hadn't smoked for 60 years, he would have lived to about 120. <laughs> <laughs> this way he only died at only 94. <laughs> nice. But the last years he had emphysema, he had mm -hmm. pleurisy, various diseases from mm -hmm. having smoked for, for such right. a long time. Um, 
but he, he was pretty active right to the end. He, he even got married again because my mother passed away. She was very young. She was right. 47 mm -hmm. when she passed away. She died right before I turned 13, right before my bar mitzvah. Mm. Um, and um, he, he, he remarried at 82. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, did you have any brothers and sisters? No. I'm, I'm an only child. You're the only child. When, uh, when mm -hmm. I came out, my parents took one look at me and said, we're not making any more of those. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that, but okay. I saw your picture, so I know that's not true. <laughs> but you didn't show in the interview. But, mm -hmm. uh, so, so when did you become interested? I know t uh, today that you're on the Holocaust Commission here mm -hmm, in Alabama. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and when did your interest... Uh, and I, and I, when, when, when did you become knowledgeable of basically what happened in the Holocaust and, your, and about your father? I think it was pretty much, well, well first my experience in Spain. Because I, said I, I, I spent my uh, senior year um, studying in, in Seville and the, the, the Jewish heritage of, uh, of Spain is very important just like the Muslim heritage. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see it, you feel it. Uh, I got interested in flamenco, flamenco music, and flamenco is, is very Jewish mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and Arabic, <laughs> and you know, all of this, and gypsy. So, so that started to come out, and I started to see things. But then, definitively, it was in graduate school in St. Louis. Hmm. Um, and how old were you I was, I was 21. 21, okay. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it had to do with uh, my dissertation supervisor because he was Jewish and he had a similar story. His, his parents left Germany and they went to Cuba mm -hmm. and he was born and in, in raised as a child in Cuba. So <coughs> he was interested did, in did it. Did they come through the Vatican as well? Uh, no, okay. no, they, they, they went directly to, um, to Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he started talking to me about this. Oh, we have a similar story. And, and, and that's where I started to get interested mm -hmm. and, and asking my father about, about various things. Um, and that how did generally your father speaking, take he that? Would, he, well, he didn't, he didn't want to talk about it. So the first time you approached him, you go away? Yeah, <laughs> essentially go away. I told mm -hmm. you stories, that's enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't want to bring back those memories. Mm -hmm. And, and it, that, was, that was right until the end because when I graduated with my PhD, uh, I sent him a plane ticket to come to St. Louis because this was going to be my last graduation. Mm -hmm. And he came to St. Louis and he met my dissertation uh, supervisor, Dr. Joseph Schreiberman, and they started talking about that period of time. And uh, Joe would say this and this happened in this and this place. And my, my father was there, <laughs> so mm -hmm. he talked about this. And later on in, in the evening, in the hotel room, he told me, I'm sorry that I talked about those things because it brought back those memories. And Was he visibly depressed afterwards? Um, I wouldn't say depressed, mm -hmm. but he just didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He just didn't want to talk didn't about it because it was, it was a, back, a, yeah. a, a horrific, uh, it's, it's the most horrific experience that we can, we, that we can imagine, mm -hmm. that kind of brutality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what of the rest of your father's family? Well, um, the you said some are actually are in Vienna today. Th there were some. Or were some in the seventies. In, in Vienna, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> distantly related cousins, things like mm -hmm. this. Uh, his younger sister and, and her husband um, were in New York. They have both passed away, but I have uh, they are three children. I have three cousins mm -hmm. from them. Uh, my cousin Lenny, who was the oldest. Uh, he and I grew up, we grew up on the same block until we were six years old. Uh, he's, he still lives um, right upstate New York in, mm -hmm. um, in Muncie. Uh, and he, he and his family is, are uh, Orthodox. Mm -hmm. um, the eldest sister, she went to Australia mm -hmm. and had a family there. She, has, she and her husband have passed away, but we still have cousins. I think there are two or three So um, she stayed in girls. Australia? She stayed in Australia. Mm -hmm. Right, she, she had gotten a um, uh, letter of transit from him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and and that, that's a story also because he had obtained a letter of transit to go to um, uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. And he was getting ready to go. And she said she was <coughs> intending to marry 
And she said, please, 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 let me have you a letter of transit, let me have you a letter of transit, let me have you a letter of transit. She drove him crazy, and he mm -hmm. said, okay, I'll <laughs> let you have it. But when you get to Australia, send for me. Mm -hmm. And when she got to Australia, she sent for Philip, <laughs> her, husband, her husband, and my father was stuck in, um, <laughs> in Austria and Vienna. Yeah. And, and had to look for another way out. Exactly, <laughs> had to look for another way out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm assuming since he was helping so many people escape, that he eventually had planned his escape and not what it turned out to be. <laughs> exactly. This incredible journey that he ended up on. Exactly. That took uh, from 39 to 41 to finally reach the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, going back to you serving on the Holocaust Commission, just have a, a brief question about that. Have you told the other members your personal story? I have told my story. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have had on the on the on the commission uh, since I've been on it two Holocaust survivors. There's one who's still uh, on the commission, mm -hmm. uh, Max Herzl. He's the, he's the treasurer, mm -hmm. and also I'm I'm also on the uh, education committee. So I've been invited this to this is the to Holocaust Education Committee. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Um, that's part of the commission, and we we do travel around and, and speak in schools and in organizations and things like this. So I've done that a, a number of times, and also every year uh, on the day on the day of remembrance, mm -hmm. we have a um, commemoration at the legislature in Montgomery, and the last uh, few years Governor Riley has come to speak, mm -hmm. and precisely in this publication, Southern Jewish Life, from June 19, 2010. The picture, Riley addresses Alabama Holocaust commemoration, and there a picture of uh, Governor Riley speaking here. And here, uh, survivors or family of survivors come up to, to light candles in memory of the um, Holocaust victims, and I'm standing right here. <laughs> so, so this is this is a, a, a very interesting and very moving um, event mm -hmm. to be there in the legislature uh, with legislators, with survivors, with people who are interested in this. There, there are even uh, schools that come that bring students to mm -hmm. witness this. They're up in the balcony and things like this. Uh, so this this is a yearly. Um, commemoration mm -hmm. and it's a very important one very, very moving one mm -hmm. so um, my, the community here is aware of this they, they have this cut out on the bulletin board mm -hmm. <laughs> in the temple um, and then it writes Robert <laughs> yeah. so are you was, a member of the, of the local uh, yes temple? yes and, and mm -hmm. I've been president of the congregation for a couple of years uh, also Wonderful. I'm not now um, mm -hmm. but I have been Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. Yes, the, the, the Jewish community here is important to me also. And we do uh, events, events like this and speaking uh, um, And I'm just curious also, um, also uh, given the fact that uh, historically in Pope Pius XII has been vilified in, in uh, many, many articles and, and uh, historical books, um, I'm just curious what the other survivors that have served with you on the commission, what was their reaction to your story, to hear that the Pope had helped your father? Well, their, their reaction first, first was surprise mm -hmm. and then understanding mm -hmm. because had Pope Pius publicly declared against Hitler, would have been disastrous for the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this way he was able to maintain the network of the Catholic Church in 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 these countries and be able to help Jews. He, he, was, he was enough of a statesman and enough of, of aware mm -hmm. to know that if, if they had declared against Hitler... Then Hitler would have declared war on them. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and one of the examples of this is and, that my and father and escaped And Hitler from was planning to declare war on them. Absolutely. It was the, uh, um, the understanding is that after the Jews, the Catholics would have been next. Mm -hmm had he been able to continue. Yeah, and evidence of this is that my father escaped with a German priest. Mm -hmm. So there was a German priest on the train getting transferred to a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. So the, um, um, the Catholic Church was to some degree under the gun mm -hmm. 
or at least the, the Nazis had the, had their eye on the on the ch on the church. Sure, they, so. they definitely <laughs> had their eye on the church. That's, exactly, uh, and so. and historically, even recently, you're seeing more and more of that. Those mm -hmm. uh, the documents and the testimony to show that that was coming. Exactly. That as soon as so. they had finished with the so-called Jewish problem, mm -hmm. the Catholics were the next. Yeah. So. Yeah, they were, they were going to be part of the final solution. <laughs> so even, even though uh, probably historically, and, and there's reasons to support that, uh, that uh, Pope Pius uh, XII was prior to uh, ascension to the papacy, that he already had been speaking out against the Nazis. There's yeah. documenting, yeah. but... Exactly. The, the, ends do, the ends justify the means in this case. Uh, he was able to save lives and understood that had he stood up, Mm -hmm. Chances are he would; those lives would have gone. So Absolutely. he had to he had to make a terrible choice from mm -hmm. the sound mm -hmm. of it. And and he, my feeling is absolutely he did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, lives were at stake, so he, sure. he I'm sure that uh, the Catholic uh, papacy feels the same way we do. Life is yeah. is precious. Yeah. And and and, uh, and in this passport, you could see the connections mm -hmm. that. Um, it uh, tracks along with up, all yeah. of the, yeah. It tracks along with all the documentation that we already have. Exactly. That, that talks about the journeys that people took, mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to the Vatican and right. the visas. And, and the heads of state who were influenced uh, by by the Pope and by the uh, by the Church. Mm -hmm. So, in your opinion, we own the Pope, uh, uh, Pius the Twelfth. A great debt. A great debt and Absolutely. gratitude Absolutely. and. Uh, Mm -hmm. We should definitely recognize historically what the real facts are rather than allow the constant vilification that's taken place. Absolutely. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for telling your story. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do that. It's a pleasure, and uh, I hope that uh, this will help to set the record straight. I hope so, because um, Yad Vashem is, is a very important um, entity, and... <laughs> has a lot of our respect and recognizes uh, people who have done so much uh, for the Jews in the world. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean the program to recognize righteous Gentiles and because you know, what we remember, have to remember even in all the horror that it, we experienced in, in this, at this time there were good people. Absolutely. And as always, the the worst people always make the headlines, and the <laughs> the people that the quietly that are preserving the world, basically by their good deeds, uh, largely go unnoticed for, or untold. And in this case, untold for obvious political reasons. Exactly. It couldn't be told. So exactly. I thank you for your courage and, and, and willingness to speak up. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs>